Well, we're looking today at 2 Samuel chapter 23, the passage that has been read to us, but I want to begin a little earlier, so please open your Bible at 2 Samuel and chapter 21, just a couple of pages earlier, chapter 21. Now, we looked last week at the return of the king, that is, King David returned in triumph uh, after the uh, Absalom's rebellion ended. It had been crushed, and with God's anointed king returning to the throne in Jerusalem, you would think and perhaps hope that the last years of David's life would be filled with peace and joy. But we have seen throughout this series that David's life really falls into three parts, his trials, his triumphs, and his troubles. And troubles really followed David unrelentingly in these later years of his life. We have seen that he lived these later years under constant pressure and that he faced relentless opposition. And so, perhaps it's not surprising then to find in chapter 21 and verse 15 that towards the end of his life, this great king became weary. Chapter 21 and verse 15, there was war again between the Philistines and Israel. And David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines. And here it is. And David grew weary. The man that slayed Goliath, the great heroic king, the man with all these extraordinary accomplishments, and he grew weary. Now, weariness is cumulative. Uh, It is the result of pressures that build up in a person's life over a period of time. And so, to see what led to David's weariness, I want us to go back just one page further to um, uh, 2 Samuel and chapter 20. And you'll notice there um, what, what, what led up to and contributed to this weariness that overcame David late in his life. Um, as if Absalom's rebellion had not been enough, no sooner was it um, uh, crushed uh, and defeated than we have in chapter 20 the story of another rebellion. Um, there happened, chapter 21, uh, chapter 20 and verse 1, there happened to be a worthless man, uh, we would say literally a scoundrel of a man, whose name was Sheba. He was the son of Bichri, and he was a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet, which of course is what Absalom had done just a short time earlier. And he said, we have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse, so every man to his tents, O Israel. So, you see the pattern here. No sooner is one rebellion against God's anointed king over, and another rebellion against God's anointed king begins. And Sheba, we're told, was a Benjamite. That means he was of the same tribe as King Saul. But his appeal when he blew the trumpet was quite clearly not limited to the tribe of Benjamin, because we're told, verse 2, that all the men of Israel, all the men of Israel withdrew from David. And they followed Sheba, the scoundrel, the son of Bichri. Now, imagine this. At this point, after all that David has done, all the victories that he has won, all of his uniting of God's people together, late in his life, 11 of the 12 tribes, they go and they follow a scoundrel, and they give up their loyalty to God's anointed king. Just think about it. David For all his faults, and we've picked up on them and acknowledged them as the Bible does throughout its account, for all his faults, He was the best king God's people ever had in the Old Testament. But when even a scoundrel blows the trumpet, 11 out of the 12 tribes, they're ready to abandon David and go off and follow Sheba, the son of Bichri. You know, with hindsight, David is honored, revered, the greatest of the Old Testament kings. It wasn't like that at the time. 
Why in the world, do you think, could God's people not just see how blessed they were in David? Why couldn't they rejoice in the good gifts they had received from the hand of God? The enemies subdued, the people of God united as never before. But that's the human condition, isn't it? Receive good gifts from God and turn away again and again and again and again and again. Except that not everyone turned away from God's anointed. We're told, verse 2, but the men of Judah, that of course was David's own tribe, the men of Judah followed the king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. And so they stayed loyal with him all the way back to Jerusalem. But think about this. When then the king returns in triumph, even then there's only one tribe that stands with him. It's his own tribe. The king's own stand with him, and they stand with him on the day of his return. But they were the only ones. And so, right at the end of his life, because we're getting right to the closing chapters now, David is, in effect, right back when he start, where he started. Um, way back at the beginning of 2 Samuel, in chapter 2 and verse 4, after King Saul died, David, who had already been anointed, and so he knew it was the purpose of God for him to be king, he inquired of the Lord, should he go up to any of the towns? And God answered him. He said, go to Hebron. Hebron was a little place with great historic significance. Another little place out in the sticks, only this time down in the south. And David goes to this little place, and he's anointed as king there by his own people, the tribe of Judah in Hebron, in all amongst all of the Old Testament people of God. There's only this one little group who'll recognize him and receive him as their king and everyone else is against him. And now here he is at the end of his life. He's in exactly the same position. And he must have wondered, looking back over his life, well, has any good been done? What has come of all of my years of effort serving these people? Is this all the thanks I get? And there will be moments in your life when you wonder what you have really achieved. It comes to us all. You build something up, and then for one reason or another, it seems to be torn down. You find yourself saying, why did I bother? What was the point? Now, no wonder David began to be weary. Sheba's rebell rebellion, of course, failed. You can read the rest of that story in the account there. But at the end of David's life, there was yet another of these rebellions, as if to remind us that the cycle seems never to end in the history of the world. If you turn just a few pages forward now to 1 Kings and chapter 1, you'll see yet another rebellion. David's just about in his deathbed now, 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 5, and we read Adonijah, who was another son of David, Absalom's half-brother. He was the son of Haggith, that is, his mother. So, Adonijah exalted himself. Notice the problem. He exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him, which, of course, is exactly what Absalom did. You can check that out back in chapter 15. He got chariots, he got horsemen, and 50 people to run in front of him. Now, his half-brother says, well, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. So, one rebel rises and is crushed, then there's a scoundrel comes up and he fails, and now there's another son of David and he rises. Is there ever any end to it? No wonder David is weary. This is the cycle of human history and of rebellion. It goes on and on and on against God's anointed king. Now, turn back to chapter 21, if you would. And having looked at the context both before and after this statement about David's weariness, I want you to notice what seems to have been the last straw, as it were, for David. Back to verse 15, where we were a moment ago, chapter 21. There was war again between the Philistines and Israel. 
And David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines, and David grew weary. Now, I want you to notice, if you have the Bible open in front of you, how this word again is repeated again and again. Verse 15, there was war again between the Philistines and Israel. Verse 18, after this, there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. You say, war with the Philistines? Oh, not again. And when you get to the point of saying that, you then read verse 19, and there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. And then just in case you haven't got the point, verse 20, there was again war at Gath. Now, you see the pattern. No wonder David was weary. When will these battles ever end? Now, of course, the best-known story about David is the story about David and Goliath. Very, very early in David's life, he was the one who was, by the power of God, able to slay the giant who was a constant threat uh, to God's uh, people. But I want you to notice, while we have this chapter open in front of us, that in the last years of David's life, we read about not one, but four different giants who all came with one intent, and that was to eliminate him. The first of them, in verse 16, was a man by the name of Ishbi Benob, one of the descendants of the giants who, we're told, verse 16, thought to kill David. But he wasn't the only one. In verse 18, you have another giant by the name of Saph. In verse 19, you have a third who also took the name of Goliath, the same name as the one who David so famously uh, had slain early in his life. And then in verse 20, we have a fourth unnamed giant who is distinguished and memorable because of his having six fingers and six toes. All of these four giants have one thing in common. They all hate David. And they have one objective, and that is to destroy him. And here's David. He's nearly at the end of his life. And the obvious question is, is there no end to this? Now, think about it. The great achievements of David's life, we've noticed this throughout the series, were two. Unite the people of God and subdue their enemies. And at the end of David's life, everything that he had done seems to be undone. That's why he was weary. At the end of David's life, what do we find? God's people are divided. Eleven of the twelve tribes are off after Sheba, the son of Vikri. And the enemies that have been subdued now again are rampant. There's not one giant, there's four. And David very, very simply is weary, is exhausted. Anyone relating to this, by the way? The sheer relentlessness of life and the discouragement of seeing that something you have worked on seems to be torn apart. We all know what it is to face times when, like David, you grow weary, and you wonder in your discouragement if anything you've ever done in your life has any lasting value at all. Now, that is a major theme, and I've wanted to show it to you across several chapters so that you understand it really is a major theme of the last season of David's life, the sheer weariness of facing this unrelenting battle. And so, I want to draw out now from the Scriptures some biblical wisdom for times when we are weary. And there are four very practical and very wonderful things here that are helpful to me, and I hope in the same way will be helpful to you. First of all, when you are weary, Remember the world that you live in. 
You know, we do live in a fallen world, and our world is a world in rebellion against God. That's surely one of the points that we learn from this pattern of ongoing rebellion against God's anointed King. The reality of the world in which we live is simply this, that anything God has ever put in place, everything God has ever put in place, this world will seek to overthrow. Sooner or later, anything, everything God has ever put in place, this world will seek to overthrow. And the world will keep inventing new ways of sinning. I mean, there are multiple ways of sinning today that our great-great-grandparents could not even have imagined. And 50 years from now, there will be ways of sinning that will have been invented in this world that we cannot even imagine, but it will continue to be generated from a heart that at its core is in rebellion against God. That's the world in which we live. And as long as people continue to exalt themselves rather than submit to God's anointed king, there will continue to be wars, and there will continue to be rumors of wars, and our world will continue to be a world in conflict. The rebellion is vertical, and the conflict that results from it is horizontal. And as long as the one continues, the other can never end. So, this world, understand this, the biblical worldview, this world can never evolve into a panacea of peace and love and joy. It never will, because it's a world in rebellion against God. Remember the world in which you live. The dream, of course, of the world evolving into a panacea of love and peace and joy, that dream is in the heart of every new generation. Imagine. But it cannot happen. Not in a world that is in rebellion against its own king. We live in a world of rebellion and of conflict. David can't stop it. We can't stop it. There's only one who can bring it to an end, and one day he will, and that is Jesus Christ. And he will bring in a world of love and peace and joy, but it will be a new creation, and all rebellion will be outside. So, when you are weary, remember what world you live in. Second, and very practical, remember that God has placed others around you. What a blessing this is when you're weary. Remember that God has placed others around you. Look at chapter 21 and verse 17, but Abishai the son of Zeruiah came to David's aid, and he attacked the Philistine and killed him. And then David's men swore to him, you shall no longer go out with us to battle, lest, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. Now, what we learn here very simply is that even God's best servants grow weary and need the help of others. That was true for David, and there will be times when it is true for you as it is true for me. You see what this friend Abishai says to David? David, you don't have to be the one who slays all the giants, you know. It's God who gives the victory and God can give the victory through others as much as He can give the victory through you. So, when you are weary, learn to accept the help of others. Some of us find this so hard to do. But when you are weary, learn to accept help from others. I don't suppose David particularly liked it when Abishai said, let me take this one for you, and the time now is for you to step back and for you to allow someone else to take the heat of the conflict on your behalf. But it was the providence of God, the provision of God, that put this man next to David so that in his weariness he would not be utterly crushed, but would be helped by a brother sister, 
brother or sister who Christ puts next to you. When you're weary, remember what world you live in. And when you're weary, remember that God has placed other people around you. Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid when he was weary. And perhaps, too, you will want to take this application. Are your eyes open towards a brother or a sister who needs your help right now? And you might be the means, the Abishai to David, the one who would come alongside and help to lift the load and sustain one of God's servants at a time when a crushing burden is upon her or upon his shoulders. That's the provision of God, and it's a wonderful gift in the body of Christ. Third, when you're weary, remember that victory may be closer than you think. When you're weary, remember that victory may be closer than you think. This, to me, is something very wonderful. When these four giants arose, David must have thought, will this never end? I mean, I've, I've seen off Goliath, and now I'm an old man, and now I've got four of them, and they're coming after me. But do you know that this is the last reference to the giants in the entire Bible? This, and of course, the parallel account that comes in First Chronicles that speaks of the same time. After this, no more giants, not anywhere in the Bible at all. This was it. And at the point where David was most weary, he was actually most near the point of victory, and perhaps he never even knew it. It's fascinating, you see, that when you get to the reign of Solomon, there is not a single reference to a giant during his entire reign, nor is there in the reign of any of the subsequent kings for the rest of the Bible story. What we're told about Solomon is that Solomon ro ruled, 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 2, over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt, and they brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. So, David's fighting Philistines all the days of his life. The Philistines are bringing tribute to Solomon all the days of his life. And this was the last. It was the end right here, and David hardly even knew it. So, you see, the enemies of David were subdued. And the people of God, who again at the end of his life seemed to be unraveling themselves, were actually united under the reign of Solomon. The two great achievements of David's life that seemed to fall apart in his later years actually were sustained. David faced these endless battles, and he was so weary because he wondered if he'd accomplished anything, and actually he'd accomplished a great deal. God will only show you a very small part of what you have accomplished for Him in the course of your life in this world. The rest is what you will see in heaven, and your joy will be very great. David faced endless battles. Solomon entered into great joys. That was when the temple was built. That's when the glory of the Lord came down among His people. All that happened in the life of Solomon was the fruit of what was accomplished in the life of David. And think about this, that when David was most weary, he was closer to triumph than he would ever have dared to dream. And that may be true for someone who is weary here today, that you feel so tired of the battle and you may be closer to victory than you ever dare to dream that prayer that you have been praying for years. How do you know how close you are to victory? You don't know. The last of the giants one day will come, and one day will go, and David in his weariness was much closer to triumph than he ever imagined. And then there's a fourth thing, and this is why we read from chapter 23. So, finally, we get back to it. It's a wonderful story. 
When you are weary, remember this world in which you live in, what world it is that you live in. Remember the people that God has placed around you. Remember that victory may be closer than you think. And most of all, when you are weary, remember how much you are loved. How much you are loved. More than anything else, when you are tired of the battle, this is what you need to take in, and may God give this to us right now through the Scripture, to take in a fresh knowledge of just how much you are loved. And I want you to see how God ministers this into David's life at this point of the story. Chapter 23, in the middle of all this darkness, all this weariness, all this discouragement, we have a marvelous story that just shines out like a beacon of hope. And it reminds us that despite all of the opposition that David faced, the ingratitude of 11 tribes, the relentlessness of all of these enemies, David nonetheless was dearly, dearly loved. Now, almost certainly, this story that is recorded in 2 Samuel in chapter 23 actually took place at a much earlier time in David's life. And the reason for saying that is that we're told, verse 13, that David was at the cave of Adullam. Now, that was the place where David hid in his early years when he was on the run from King Saul. So, the obvious question is, well, if the story took place a lot earlier, why is it recorded here rather than earlier uh, in uh, the account of First or Second Samuel? And the answer may well be this, that this story is here because David needed it here. And it may very well be that when David was at his lowest point, someone came alongside and just reminded him of this story that forever stood as a, an impression of the depth of the love with which David really was loved. I suspect that what happened is that at David's lowest point, one of his friends came along and said, David, I want to remind you of something that happened a lot of years ago, but you will never forget it, and neither will I. And he told this story, and that it brought refreshment, and that it brought help to David at his lowest point. Now, what is the story? Well, the story is that David was in this cave, a place called Adullam, and it was harvest time, verse 13, which meant that it was hot. And good water would be scarce, and David was thirsty. And David's mind goes back to the town, the little town where he grew up, a place called Bethlehem. It had always been a place that he loved. And on a hot day, he remembers going to the well at Bethlehem and being refreshed by the water and uh, maybe long past memories get glossed a little bit in the imagination, but he thinks about how good water tasted when he went to Bethlehem's well when he was a boy. No chance of going to Bethlehem now, though, because the Philistines had occupied David's hometown. Verse 60, uh, verse 14, I'm sorry, the the Philistines had established a military base of all places in Bethlehem. It was a place from which they could launch further incursions into the land that God had given to His own people. And so, we're told there that there was a garrison of the Philistines at Bethlehem. So, no point in thinking about Bethlehem, no way of getting in there for David. But as the temperature rises, David thinks about this well and the water and his memories of boyhood, and he says in an unguarded moment, longingly, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. And there's nostalgia there. Oh, this place is so dry. What would I not give for just one drink from the water of the well of Bethlehem? You get the sense of this as the king sits there feeling thirsty on a hot day. Now, Bethlehem was 15 miles away from the cave. And remember, it has become 
this little town, a garrison of Philistine soldiers. But three of David's mighty men heard what the king said, and like the heroes they were, they said, our king wants a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, let's go get it. And uh, you've got to love the spirit of these men. So they go on, uh, we would call it, it's a kind of Navy SEAL operation, this is. And at risk of their own lives, they break behind enemy lines in order to get the king they love a drink of water. It's a wonderful story. And notice that verse 16 says that the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines. So, this was not a stealth operation. It wasn't that they got in and got out at night without being noticed. They had to fight their way in, and they had to fight their way out again, and they did it. These men would do anything for David. And imagine David's surprise when these three return with a skin of water from the well, David's never asked them to do this. Uh, no doubt he would not even have known that they had gone. They simply did it on their own initiative. And they come back and they surprise the king with this extraordinary gift of sacrificial love. You asked, sir, for a drink from the well at Bethlehem. Here it is. Oh, I would have loved to have been there at that moment. Can you imagine it? By the way, love looks for ways to surprise the one who is loved. It's a great thing to surprise someone you love, unexpected. A demonstration of love and of loyalty. Beautiful. But now we have the most extraordinary response. Can you picture the moment? At risk of their lives, these men have brought the skin of water to David. And it says, verse 16, but he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord. Can you imagine this? David says, oh, that someone would bring me water from the well at Bethlehem to drink. The guys hear it. They say, let's go, even at risk of our lives. Let's show our love to the king. Let's give him what he wants. They bring this back. They hand it over to him in a moment of triumph, and David takes it in his hands, and he pours the water out in the ground. If you struggle to get hold of that, you are not alone. <laughs> really? Really? The key words here, of course, are the words, to the Lord. He poured it out to the Lord. In other words, this was an act of worship. Other kings would have drunk the water. But think about it. To drink the water would be to say, satisfying my thirst means more than your lives. And David was not that kind of king. He knew that the extraordinary love and loyalty of these men was the gift of God Himself to him. And when there had been such a lavish demonstration of love as this, there was nothing else that David could think to do but to make of it an act of worship before God. And he pours out the water on the ground. There's a beautiful anticipation here of another scene in the New Testament where Mary brings at Bethany a jar of the most costly perfume. What would you think to do with something that was so costly? And she knows exactly what to do with something that is so costly. She pours it out in its entirety on Jesus Christ. And what does Judas say? He says, that's a waste. You just poured that out in the ground. To Judas, it was a waste. To Mary, it was an act of worship. What better use could I have made of this costly gift than to pour it out over the King of kings and over the Lord of lords? 
By the way, if you see other people as being there to meet your needs and to satisfy your thirsts, if you see other people like that, one of two things will happen. Either you will become demanding towards them or you will become dependent on them and you will live in fear for the rest of your life as to what God will do if they, if they are taken away. But if you see instead the people who love you as gifts from the Lord, then you will be filled with gratitude and thanksgiving for every expression of love that you receive in your life. That's what was happening here with David. He's pouring it out in thanksgiving to the Lord. This is a gift from your hand of which I'm not worthy to be loved like this. And when you see others and the gift of their love in that way, you will be confident in the God who gave that gift to you. It's an amazing story. Now, let me end with this in these last moments. How does this story apply to us? I think it would be very natural to say, well, these mighty men, they showed their love for David, their king, and what we must do now is that we must show our love for Christ, who is our king, and we must do that however risky and however costly that may be. And that would be a very valid application of this, but I don't think it's the best one. I think that what these mighty men did for David points us not so much as to what we do for Jesus as it points us to what Jesus has done for us. Think of this. Our Jesus is the one who broke through at Bethlehem. I mean, He went there not from a cave, but he came there from the glory of heaven. He was the one who came behind the enemy lines of a world in rebellion against him, and that's why he went to the cross. God became man in Christ Jesus, and he was born right there in Bethlehem. And why did he come? He came because our Lord Jesus Christ is the living water. He met on one occasion at a well with a Samaritan woman who could talk a very great deal about worship, but the reality was that she was very far from God. And Jesus said to her, now look, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but everyone who drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And then a little later in John's gospel, the, um, uh, Jesus stood up. And he said, on the last day of the feast, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So, Jesus is the one who broke through for us in Bethlehem. And why did He break through? Because He is the living water, and He wants to bring to us the living water. And how does He bring us the living water? The answer to that is by the pouring out of His life on the ground. His life was poured out. In fact, there's a remarkable psalm, Psalm number 22. You might like to read it in its entirety sometimes. It gives the most extraordinary prophetic description of what happened at the cross. And in Psalm 22 and verse 14, we have these remarkable words that you can hear as if they were spoken from the mouth of Jesus Christ Himself. I am poured out like water, and all of my bones are out of joint. Some of you know what it is, how painful it is to have one bone out of joint. You been there? You think of what it's like to be crucified. All my bones are out of joint, all of everyone. And what's happening as Jesus is pulled apart on the cross is that He is being poured out like water.
David's mighty men risked their lives to bring David a drink of water. But Jesus did more than risk his life for you when he came into this world. He gave his life for you so that the living water could be yours. He gives us this water at the price of his blood. And David's breath must have been taken away by the sheer love of these men who would risk their lives to bring him a drink of water. Well, what are you going to say about the King of Kings who gave his life? It was poured out so that the living water and the eternal life that it represents would be yours. We struggle to get our minds around David pouring out such costly water on the ground. How will you ever get your mind around the supremely valuable life of Jesus Christ being poured out for you? And yet, this is at the very heart of the gospel. And when you are weary, here's what you need to take in, how much you are loved. Do you know how much you are loved? The Son of God loved you, and He gave Himself for you. And this Lord who loves you is therefore worthy of the deepest love and loyalty of your life, irrespective of its cost. Father, many of us come before you today knowing the limits of our own resources and feeling the weight and the burden of weariness upon us. Thank you for a Savior who says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. I pray, Father, that every one of your children may have a profound awareness today of how much they are loved. Father, take our breath away with the love of Christ. Cause us afresh to gasp at the wonder of being loved like this. Thank you that in your great mercy, in a world of never-ending thirsts, you are the one who gives the living water that will go on welling up even to everlasting life. Thank you that such a costly gift is ours through Jesus Christ, who poured himself out for us. Grant, therefore, that we may not hesitate, however weary, to go on pouring ourselves out for the Savior who loved us and gave himself for us, and to his name be all the praise and all the glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.